Thank you. Hello, I'm Amy from Contra Costa County Library, and I'm here today with my coworkers, Becky from the Pittsburgh Library and Desiree from Library Administration. We are recording today's event, so if you do not want your image to appear in the recording, please keep your camera turned off. The Contra Costa County Library is happy to connect you with our resources, services, and materials at all 26 branches. Access more than 1 million physical items, including international language collections, and thousands of digital materials 24-7 at cccLIB.org. Go to our website and sign up for a digital library card today. Now, I'm going to do the fun things, see our guests. <laughs> And what happened to, well, missing one of our guests. Where is she? Where'd she go? Are we good? Oh, there you are, Sue. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So thank you today for joining us for Bridging the Literacy Gaps, a panel discussion. As the library, we strive to support all readers including young struggling readers and their families. We are thrilled that three experts in reading and literacy are here today to continue our discussion. And I'm gonna introduce them right now. Sue Brazil is the mother of a child with dyslexia and an experienced advocate of the Orton-Gillingham instructional approach to reading, spelling, and writing. She is also a lead volunteer with the Read Charitable Foundation a good source for information, education, facts about structured literacy and dyslexia. So thank you for being here today, Sue. Thank you for having me. Shelley Velasco is the coordinator of elementary instruction in Pittsburgh Unified School District. She has spent 14 years as a site administrator, working to eliminate the educational and systematic barriers that impact academic achievements. Mrs. Velasco successfully moved her elementary school from being the lowest performing school in the district to the second highest in two years. Before that, she served as the principal of a junior high school that ranked as the third highest performing school in the district. Thank you for being here, Mrs. Velasco. We're happy Thank to have you. you. <laughs> And then finally, Dr. Kathy Futterman has worked in the field of special education for over 30 years. She is a lecturer and field work supervisor at Cal State East Bay in the departments of educational psychology and teacher education. Dr. Futterman is a district-wide dyslexia and literacy education specialist with the Mount Diablo Unified School District, in addition to having a private practice as an educational therapist. So now each panelist is gonna have an opportunity to briefly share their thoughts on today's topic of bridging literacy gaps. And immediately following that, Dr. Funderman is going to give us a short presentation on dyslexia. And then we will provide you with the opportunity to ask your questions. We will mostly take questions through chat. So feel free to add them anytime as you think of them. You can put them in now or later. But we may allow you to turn on your microphones as we get into the program to ask a question that way if you prefer. But please do remember that if you turn on your camera, you may appear in the recording. You are welcome, as I said, to put the questions in chat anytime as we go along and we'll be collecting them. So now let's start with uh, Sue Brazil. Hi, uh, I'm Sue Brazil. Um, thank you for having me on. Uh, like you, like Amy said, I am a mom of a once struggling reader. Um, I have, my son Ben is now in sixth grade, he's 12 years old. And when he first started school, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, he just wasn't reading. He was not catching on. He had um, tutoring. Um, which wasn't helping. And, you know, we just couldn't figure out what was going on and homework time would come and he would have these meltdowns. And uh, it was a, it was 
it was such a difficult time for for him for for us as a family i mean it was um it was a real struggle so eventually um uh, and i will say he was normal in every other sense of the word he was smart he was athletic um funny everything just super smart but just when it came to reading um he just couldn't get it and by second grade he felt it and we were, I was driving him to school one day and he said, um, well, I've got the, this list, this vocabulary, this vocabulary list because I'm stupid. And so immediately when I got to school, I talked to the administrators and I, I said, someone needs to help me. Nobody could help me. There was very little help for me. They just said, oh, we just, you know, sometimes it takes boys a while. Um, you know, we know he's smart. Um, so it was disheartening to find that there was no answers right away. And not long after his second grade reading teacher suggested that I have him tested uh, for dyslexia. She said, I'm not going to say dyslexia, but I think maybe he has dyslexia. So immediately I got, um, I had him tested and sure enough, he was um, dyslexic. And as soon as I found out that he was dyslexic, I thought, okay, how can we fix this? And his school said, well, he can still get tutoring, but we don't know how to tutor him. We can't help him, but please keep him in the school. Um, so uh, needless to say, I did not keep him in that school, but I was really lucky in our area. There was a school that taught to the dyslexic, which is the Orton Gillingham. It's the science of reading. Um, and he caught on, he started there in third grade because after during second grade COVID hit, so we didn't go back to school. And then when third grade started, he started at this new school and a program that they have uh, called the bridge program and everyone in the class is dyslexic. And the hardest thing I think for, 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 for me was finding other moms that had the same problem. And it was heartbreaking as a mom to see all his classmates excelling. And um, this is back at the other school. And just even neighbor kids that would read and they love to go to the library and my son never loved to go to the library. He, you know, he just hated anything that had to do with it. So um, fast forward now, he's in sixth grade. He started the program in third grade. Um, so he did third, fourth and fifth grade in the bridge program. Now he's in traditional classroom and he has A's and B's. Um, but not to say there was not some trauma along the way. He still does not love school. Uh, he gets he gets through it. Um, but I think there was trauma associated with that. Um, and I have found actually now uh, through lots of research, lots of finding other moms, I have a whole community because the uh, fact is that one in five uh, kids have dyslexia. And uh, so it's a lot more common than we think. Um, and so, uh, you know, he is thriving. I have found a community and I volunteer heavily with the Reed Charitable Foundation, which was started by a mom whose uh, son Reed is a grade uh, ahead of my son. And he, she ran into the same thing. There was nowhere for help. There is one school where I live in central Florida uh, that, that teaches this Orton Gillingham method. And, um, so I know that as a parent, it's hard to find help, which is, um, it's very stressful and, um, but it's out there. And, um, that's a little bit about my story. Um, I know these struggling readers are super smart. I think there's all kinds of, um, learning, um, learning differences that they have, but um, hopefully, you know, there's ways to connect with organizations or people that can help you. Like you're not alone. This is more common than we think. So that's about it.
Thank you, Sue. That was great. I really appreciate it. We're sure. now going to uh, pass it to Shelly Velasco from the Pittsburgh Unified School District. I'm going to make you big, Shelly. There you go. <laughs> so go ahead and start whenever you want. Great. Thank you. Um, so thank you to everybody for joining us. Thank you for to the library for hosting this great event. Um, I um, have a passion for reading and teaching and literacy. And so in addition to my work life, I also have a home life and um, I have two children as well. I have a daughter who is in eighth grade currently and a son who's in fifth grade. And my journey around reading, although I was a teacher to begin with, um, really started when she was born. I was very interested in making sure she started school um, ready and prepared and, and doing well in school. And that's where my um, beginning of the work that I do began and my passion for this work. And like many of you who are parents on this, um, that's one of the things I think that think that brings you to this, right? How, how are we supporting our scholars and how are we supporting our students? One of the um, things that we discovered um, a long time ago in Pittsburgh is that, you know, in the state of California, we're not educating our teachers in the way we need to, to be experts as uh, teachers of reading. And so unfortunately, they gave us in my teaching credential program, one night of phonemic awareness and one night of phonics and said, you're ready to go. Well, we know now that that's just really not enough. And so Pittsburgh Unified School District has spent the last seven years working on better understanding. And of course, they call it the science of reading. And I hate to use a fancy word like that, but that really means all of the research that comes together to help us understand what we need. And so that's phonemic awareness and it's the sounds that we hear, phonics and that's how we say those sounds, our vocabulary, um, reading comprehension. So it's a variety of things that really lead to this. One of the other things that we do in Pittsburgh Unified School District is we have one literacy coach at each of our school sites. And that literacy coach, we test all of our kids from TK to three. And we do that three times a year so that we know exactly where all of our scholars are in that learning to read journey. And so all of those tests are age and developmentally appropriate. And we inform parents of where we are. And that's kind of some of the information that you need to know as a parent or as an educator, that there are assessments and there is information that you wanna to begin to ask of your school. How are they being assessed? What kind of information can I get as a parent to help my child and know where they are in that learning to read journey? And so um, really critical is this work that we wanna make sure that we reach out to our parents and we say, hey, here's where your child is. They may or may not be making as much progress as we'd like them to make. As Sue told the story of her son, right? We wanna make sure that even beginning in TK, that they're learning their letters and sounds. And at kindergarten, they're learning their letters and sounds and they've got those mastered. We want them to be able to do it really quickly. And then as they're sunsetting from kindergarten and entering into first grade, they're beginning to put those sounds together and reading words. So very short words with simple sounds. So those kinds of hallmarks are the things that trigger us as teachers and educators to say, hmm, you may want to look closer into this particular scholar um, and see what's going on. Is our instruction helping to affect what they're doing in the classroom. We pull all of our students every day for small group instructional time and really focus in on the skills that they're struggling at. And that's another question to ask if you're concerned with your child at home would be, what, time, what are you doing to help my child? What kind of um, practice are you doing in the classroom? Are there, is there some practice I can continue at home? 
And trust me, um, the work at home is never pretty, right? Um, even as a teacher, there are times where it's messy, right? I don't want to do that, mom. I'm not interested in doing that, mom, right? I'd rather go play or on be on YouTube, right? I'd rather watch a YouTube short, right? I don't want to do any of this right now. And, and it's really about, it doesn't have to be pretty. It really is sometimes using an Expo marker, one of those whiteboard markers, which you can get really inexpensively at the dollar store. And as they're brushing their teeth, writing letters on the mirror. What letter is that? And that erases real quick with the sock, right? And so what letter is that? So kind of having fun while they're there brushing their teeth anyway. So something that easy can really help to to motivate them and not be a very long duration. One of the other things that we know is that even just reading, whether you speak English or Spanish or another language, reading to them in their language is really important. Um, the more that we read to them, the, the more the love of reading develops, right? And it helps them along the way. So those are some of the things that we do in Pittsburgh Unified, some of the things that I've used in my own household, working with my children to help them in their reading journey um, that I can um, lend to this closing the reading gap. Thank you, that was great. And of course the library can help you with that and <laughs> getting those books to instill the love of reading for sure. All right, I'm gonna... Make you a little less big. Right. Okay, so Dr. Fetterman, it's your turn. We'd love to hear from you next. Hi, well, thank you so much for having me. And it's always uh, a pleasure and so important to be supporting our uh, library and Contra Costa Library does a fantastic job supporting um, all of our readers. Um, I'm going to mention a few different organizations and uh, resources that I think would be very helpful uh, for parents. Uh, one is Decoding Dyslexia California. If you've not heard of that yet, um, it is free to go on their website and join and be a member. And they do have uh, local parent support groups. Another resource is the Reading League California. The Reading League California is a new chapter of the Reading League, and the Reading League has a um, free ebook all about what is the science of reading. Why do uh, parents and teachers and educators need to know about what the science of reading is? Um, and um, another um, website uh, I'm going to mention too is CaliforniaKidsRead.org because there is a new piece of legislation, AB 2222, that um, uh, is going to um, require that um, all uh, local education agencies, all schools and school districts use structured literacy that's aligned with the science of reading. And Orton Gillingham is one type of structured literacy approach so that the way that we teach all of our students um, uh, in reading is evidence-based um, and steeped in decades of research that we know to be successful um, with all of our students, not just students with dyslexia. Um, and I feel like there, oh, the other uh, resource I was gonna mention that I think would be helpful, very helpful for parents too, um, this, the book is not free, but the hot link is free. Um, the, there are California dyslexia guidelines, um, and you could just Google California dyslexia guidelines for the PDF. And in the California dyslexia guidelines, um, that covers what the definition of dyslexia is. I'm going to just do a very quick uh, presentation in a minute on what dyslexia is, the characteristics that you see at different grade levels, including um, all the way from pre-kindergarten through to adult. So if you suspect or you're concerned that your child might have signs or symptoms of dyslexia, the dyslexia, California dyslexia guidelines could help with that. It also covers the um, uh, uh, tips for parents um, and additional assistive technology resources understanding the difference between screening and assessment. And that um, brings me to another point I wanted to mention. Um, the state of California in the fall of 2025 
we did pass a piece of legislation that we will be screening all students kindergarten through second grade for being at risk for reading failure. So that's happening fall of 2025 um, at every public school. So that's happening. So I think, um, Amy, if it's okay, I'll just go ahead and share my screen and do a quick. Yes, um, please go right ahead. Dyslexia basics. Okay. Should come up. There we go. Okay. Yep. Looks good. Okay. Fantastic. Oops. Let's go back one. Awesome. So the definition of dyslexia um, can be found, like I said, not only in the California Dyslexia Guidelines, but it was originally written and designed by the International Dyslexia Association. That's another fantastic resource. Um, they have an excellent website with free resources there. And there's also a Northern California branch of the International Dyslexia Association. So once you get into this world, um, there really are a plethora of resources for parents, for educators, for uh, whomever is interested in learning more. And I'm going to read the definition and then I'm going to just take it apart uh, a little bit. Dyslexia is a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin, and it's characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. So the word uh, and the uh, identification of dyslexia to get that term in a public school setting would fall under if a student went all the way through to special ed um, assessment and was found eligible underneath the category of a specific learning disability, that's where they would be potentially designated uh, as having dyslexia. And students um, have difficulty with their single word reading. So when they go to try to read either phonetically regular words or what some people refer to as sight words or whole recognition, one or the other or both is challenging for the student. Um, and that, gonna, that is gonna be seen along with poor spelling. And then when they go to read text, um, they make a number of errors and mistakes. And these difficulties are uh, typically a result from the deficit in the phonological component of language. So dyslexia is a language-based learning disability. It doesn't have to do with sight, although a symptom could be um, reversal of letters, but it is a language-based learning disability primarily due to what's called a, a deficit in phonological processing, which is difficulties with identifying and manipulating individual sounds, syllables, or words and sentences. Um, it's unexpected in relation to their other cognitive abilities, meaning that there is adequate to above average uh, cognitive abilities happening and the provision of effective classroom instruction. Um, secondary consequences we may see would be including problems with reading comprehension, because if uh, you're inaccurate as you're trying to read a text, then you're not going to typically be able to comprehend it as fully as a typical reader. And then because you're either avoiding reading or reading is hard for you, um, that is absolutely going to uh, impede or slow down uh, your growth of vocabulary and the extent of your background knowledge. So um, that's where when we say teaching either using an Orton-Gillingham based approach or what's referred to as a structured literacy approach, what we mean by that is that um, that instruction needs to be multi-sensory, direct, explicit, systematic, cumulative. Um, so uh, there's a, a specific way that we teach that um, it is uh, very much what students with dyslexia need to learn to acquire reading um, successfully. We, I already talked a little bit about that. And um, if your student or child does end up or even already has what's referred to as an IEP or an individualized education plan in special ed, this is just the definition of what specific learning disability is in the world of special education or, or if your student has an IEP. Um, it basically is defined that they have a disorder or issues in one or more of what we refer to as psychological processes 
uh, meaning that there's underlying processes that are impacting their ability to speak, listen, read, write, spell, or do math calculations. Um, and it's not a, 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 the result of visual, hearing, or motor abilities or disabilities. And it's not due primarily to an intellectual disability or serious emotional disability or cultural factors or economic disadvantage or limited English proficiency. Um, I think I went through all that. Uh, and again, just to reiterate that students with dyslexia have average to above average to superior intelligence. In fact, you can be gifted and dyslexic. And it's just really, really, really important that you tell your child, your student, um, that reading ability is separate from intellectual ability. So even though you might be struggling with reading, writing, spelling, doing your math, um, that, that does not define who you are in terms of your overall cognitive abilities. You could have fantastic long-term recall. You could have fantastic um, fluid reasoning or problem-solving abilities um, or, or uh, spatial manipulation. In fact, students with dyslexia are often our most creative, outside-of-the-box thinkers and problem solvers because they think in a different way. And, and that type of thinking is, is so needed throughout uh, not only California, but the world. Um, and just real quickly, about 44% of all students who are in special ed have what's referred to as a specific learning disability. And uh, we know that those students who get designated under specific learning disabilities, 70 to 80% of them uh, have a language-based disability, which is also known as dyslexia. We can be accurately identifying these students as young as age four. And like I said, with the new universal screener coming, that will be starting in kindergarten, so a little bit older, but kindergarten through second grade. And that dyslexia affects anywhere from five to 17% of the general population. Um, so all students, all, all people. It is hereditary. There's a hereditary component. Doesn't have to be a direct family member, but there's about a 40 to 60% heritability rate. So if you have a family history of people struggling with reading, writing, and spelling, um, or your partner or the parents of your child, that's very important information for you to know and for you to talk to the team at school about. And it can be expressed due to poor healthcare or recurring ear infections, especially during critical language developmental periods, ages six to 18 months, um, because the mapping of the individual sounds, those individual phonemes don't get mapped properly uh, in the brain. And so when the student then later gets older to try to uh, map sounds onto letters known as phonics, uh, that it, it can um, be either disorganized or, or, or the information didn't get uh, laid down in the correct way initially. And it also can be induced by high levels of um, lead poisoning. So if there's lead based paints or things like that, you want to know about that as well. We do know that dyslexia can coexist with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD can also coexist with a specific language impairment um, or autism spectrum disorders, dysgraphia, which is a disorder in written expression or dyscalculia, which are disorder or, or issues with either math calculations or mathematical reasoning and problem solving. And it can coexist with giftedness as well. Um, it's important to understand, this is just my last slide, that dyslexia exists on a continuum from mild to moderate to severe to profound. Um, and the majority of students with dyslexia, mild to moderate especially, um, absolutely can and should get their needs met in the general education classrooms, meaning that we need to make sure that all of our teachers, especially our gen ed teachers, um, are well versed in uh, understanding dyslexia, identifying it, but more importantly, also knowing how to teach using evidence-based approaches and strategies, which is referred to as structured literacy that's aligned with the science of reading. 
And um, there are, the, depending on the severity and the complexity of the dyslexia, that's gonna um, have implications for where a student might get served, whether that's in general education, small group intervention, which is still part of general education, but what we refer to as tier two, or, um, or the, is it the most complex and the most severe issues would be um, typically taken care of or supposed to be taken care of in special education. And that's what I have, so thank you. Great, thank you. That was very informative. And I'm now gonna spotlight you all again. <laughs> so we can see all of our guests. And we're gonna start, you know, uh, throwing out some questions at you. Um, this is a formal discussion, or I'm sorry, an informal discussion. So feel free to chime in if you feel like you have you know, something to add to, to the question. Um, Desiree, I did see that there are some questions in the chat. Do you um, wanna read one of them to us? Sure. Um, so there, there are a couple questions asking where to go to uh, get your child tested for dyslexia, like how to go about that. I can chime in a bit. So if you have a school-aged child, um, that would be where you would start. We would have what's called a, a student study team meeting with the teacher to look and see how your child is progressing. That's where you'd bring up your concerns with them. So again, I'd start with your teacher um, and they can start in that process if you have concerns. Um, if your child is not yet school age um you also could see the school district depending on where your school district is and um come to see what supports that they can provide and also if you had much earlier your pediatrician is always a good place to start Does anyone want to add anything to that? Or I mean, should we go? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Sue. Well, um, my son was at a private school and they don't provide the testing there. So I was referred, they gave me a sheet um, of different providers' names that could um, do the appropriate screening testing so that I did get it from the school uh, administrators because they didn't do it at the school. Yeah, and also the, the um, International Dyslexia Association, Northern California branch has a list of providers, private providers, should you be um, uh, looking in that direction who can um, uh, diagnose and test for dyslexia. But uh, like I said, our school districts everywhere, not just the state of California, our school districts are responsible for identifying students with dyslexia, whether they're in the general education setting or the special education setting. Um, and um, if you are gonna go 100% the private route, you wanna look for either somebody who is an educational therapist. There's an association of educational therapy and we are all trained to know how to um, identify and assess for specific learning disabilities. Um, uh, or a, a, a neuropsychologist. So it depends on uh, what level or how deep uh, of a, an assessment you want to receive. Thank you. That was great. Um, Desiree, is there another question in the chat that we should? Um, there is a question. Can yeah. the Orton-Gillingham approach be used when teaching students who do not have dyslexia but struggle with reading? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there's uh, plenty of evidence to show that it's highly effective with our multi-language learners, um, students who struggle with reading acquisition for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, the majority of students uh, absolutely benefit from a structured literacy approach. And that's why um, AB 2222 was written by not only Decoding Dyslexia California as a sponsor, but there's multiple Ed Voice and there's multiple other sponsors who delineate all the components that we know for effective literacy instruction. And in fact, we have something new here in the state of California. It's called a Teacher Performance Expectation 7, which outlines um, what is required now for all teachers it's gonna affect 
the new teachers more than the, the current um, veteran teachers, but that's very, very specific and um, it is that structured literacy approach. There's also another question asking if there's any opinions on SIPS, S-I-P-P-S. Um, as they said, I know some schools are using that as curriculum. Yes, that's uh, that's a good approach as well. And it's not just about the program, but it's very much about um, the knowledge of the teacher and the expertise of the teacher and the support that they're that they're getting as well. So you can give an outstanding program to a teacher who doesn't know how to use it, um, and it's not going to get you very far. So you need both hand in hand. Um, and then Dr. Futterman, uh, somebody asked, did you say there's a difference between screening and assessment? And if so, what do you mean? Yes, thank you. That's a very, that seems to be a very um, uh, question that comes up a lot. So a screening or a screener is very quick. It should be about five to 15 minutes total per student. Um, and it should just, it will just give us, meaning educators and everybody in California, information whether or not a student is at risk for reading difficulty. It's just an indicator like a, think of a vision screening or a hearing screening, like, oh, is there a little red flag? Do we have to pay attention to this particular student? And if so, in what areas? That's, that's the information it's going to tell us versus an assessment, um, especially by the time you got to the level of a special education assessment or a private assessment, those are, are, can, uh, uh, are comprised of multiple, what we call normed reference standardized assessments with multiple tools. Um, and it's, um, it's way more involved. A, a screener is very short and brief, so. Thank you. I, we do have two hands up, so I'm going to go to them first, at least two, and then we'll come back. So I'll be back to you, Desiree. Just hold on. Uh, Kimberly, you had your hand up. Did you want to unmute and say something? Yes. Um, I have a son who's in second grade. Um, he has an IEP and has had an IEP for three years now. Um, they know that his reading levels are really low. Um, and I just want to make sure, like, how do I make sure he's getting all the attention that he needs? He is in a, a mild education classroom already, um, but I need to make sure that he is getting everything he needs. First of all, can I say great job, mom? <laughs> um, way to recognize that your son right, as is struggling with something and a way to get him support. Um, because we know that with early intervention that we can provide support. So some of the questions that I would ask, right, during your IEP meeting or whenever, and you can call an IEP meeting whenever you would like as a parent, right? And so we want to ask, like, what is the curriculum that you're using, right? How many minutes a day? And that should be in that IEP paperwork that you're receiving. But just to follow up with that, how many minutes a day? Um, where um, is it a small group instruction setting? Um, is it within the general education classroom? And it sounds like he was in a mild, moderate. So perhaps he's being pulled for a smaller group instruction. And again, I would want to understand like how many minutes a day he's receiving, what they're using, um, and what progress they're seeing over time. And that should be reported during that IEP and the, doing the goal setting, um, how he performed over the year and the goals for the following year. So those would be some of my recommendations. Um, do you know if there's any summer programs in the Bay Area separate from the schools that I could look into? I'm thinking and I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I know the county, um, Contra Costa County Library does a great reading program every summer and tutoring. Um, but beyond that, I'm, I'm not sure in what district are you in? I'm in San Ramon. Hmm. So um, that is also a question that you should ask, um, especially for, during your IEP meeting. There is a, a chance that they may offer some summer programming 
um, for students who do have an IEP. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, Shala, I saw your hand up. I know I was, I was coming, I swear. And also you will put a question in the chat, but do you want to turn off on your mic and ask? <laughs> uh, hasn't happened yet. I know. Um, so you in the chat, you put a, a, how about homeschooling, but I suspect we need a little bit more on where you're going with that. Um, Give you a second. Okay. Uh, do you want to type more in the chat and I could read it that way? Because, uh, yeah, don't be. It's okay. No problem. I'm going to come back to you because I know there is a question that Becky found was still in the chat, right, Becky? That we didn't do? Yes. Um, somebody asked, how can I support a dyslexic learner to spell when they also have dysgraphia? They, the two go hand in hand. So um, once you start working with somebody who has been trained, either in Orton Gillingham, structured literacy approach, the new mood bell, SIPs, whichever approach is structured literacy, um, you are engaging the student both in decoding and encoding. So encoding is spelling and it's the reciprocal of the decoding or the single word reading. So um, you wanna make sure that that's happening. Uh, every whole complete lesson, sometimes people split a lesson in half, but that needs to be happening for each concept, every lesson that they're not only um, asked to read uh, words individually, but they're also asked to spell words utilizing or, or focusing on the same concept, like whether it's O-I or O-Y vowel pattern or something like that. If nobody has something to add, then I think Shala Man has gotten her mic on. It appears you're not muted anymore. Do you want to try? No, there she is. <laughs> All right. Uh, does anybody, I, I know it's about homeschooling. Um, maybe resources for homeschooling families around this. Um, what, what do you usually advise for homeschooling families who are um, finding that they're dealing with some struggling readers? There, there's a ton of great um, programs, both through um, Educators Publishing Service. I would direct you there, um, EPS or Educators Publishing Service. Um, they have whole uh, systematic programs that are structured literacy. They also have a whole entire homeschooling program for um, grammar, vocabulary, language, written expression, uh, whatever you might need so and it's very it's pretty explicit and not necessarily scripted but it's quite explicit and comprehensive so yeah okay thank you um, um so becky has a question what signs should we look for at home to gauge if our child might need extra support and how do parents advocate for <clears throat> extra literacy support in our schools So I can speak to a, a, a bit of this for sure. So signs that I would look for are um, not being able to identify and talk um, their letters and sounds by first grade, right? That would be something that we'd worry about as you're working through with your kindergartner and going over letters and sound. And sometimes that looks like flashcards right at home. What is this letter? What does it say, right? You would be um, also, if they're starting to not be able to blend and beginning reading in first grade and continuing on to second grade, and then partnering with your teacher. What is the teacher saying, right? What did What is a report card saying? What are they on par with the rest of the class? Are they below where the class is? That should come up during parent conferences. There are lots of um, great tips and tricks 
I see somebody put from Discoding Dyslexia, one of the early signs of reading difficulties in there for you to access. So thank you for that. And then asking your school, what are they using to teach reading? Mm -hmm. Right? That's an important question. Asking the teachers themselves, asking the school administrators, and then helping to... Um, raise that issue at the district level is really important. Um, what are we doing to support our readers? How do we know it's being effective? Um, what do we know that our teachers need to receive training in the science of reading? Um, what does that look like? What supports are we doing? So, so those are a couple of the questions that parents could help advocate for extra literacy support in their schools. If it's okay, I can read a couple bullet points of um, characteristics in pre-kindergarten um, students for dyslexia. People. Yes, please, so, thank you. A, a delay in talking or speech that's difficult to understand or difficulty with their individual sounds, difficulty recognizing their own name in print, difficulty learning nursery rhymes or recognizing rhyming patterns, a lack of interest in books or difficulty understanding directionality, turning books upside down, having difficulty learning how to tie their shoe, delayed language and vocabulary development, difficulty naming things quickly or um, accurately, maybe they're using uh, substitution for known nouns, um, difficulty following multi-step directions, pronouncing familiar words, difficulty learning their numbers, the days of the week in sequence, the months of the year, um, potentially with some articulation issues, difficulty with rhyming, um, things like that are all um, precursors for, especially for little students, but uh, before kindergarten. Um, and then Shelly mentioned a bunch once they are more school aged, so. Great, thank you. Um, just to go back a little bit to the advocacy part, uh, Sue, do you wanna speak to that a little bit? Like what, what do you think parents need to do to advocate that um, a lot of this is happening in their, in their schools. I think um, to not to be afraid to, I mean, the um, ladies covered it by saying, you know, to ask, you know, I had no idea about um, dyslexia or how you, how they learn best. So, you know, I spent a lot of time and money on tutors that were not trained properly. So that delayed us some. Um, but I would say, you know, they covered it to ask about the structured literacy. For us, it's the Orton-Gillingham. That's what is um, in my area because they have to have that proper instruction. And it's for all kids, not just dyslexia, not just dyslexics. But, um, you know, to, I would just say, don't be afraid to ask a lot of times as a parent, we think, well, they know what they're doing. I don't want to... Um, you know, overstep or, you know, come off asking too many questions or questioning what they're doing. So we kind of sit back and let them take the wheel. At least that's what I did. And I wish I had asked sooner. Um, but he was my first child, so I didn't know. And I would say also to someone that asked about um, supporting the, their child with dysgraphia, um, my child also has dysgraphia, so it's the same, but I would, I would just reiterate to them, you know, they're not stupid. They're super smart. Their brain just works differently. It's not, um, it's not anything bad. I don't even like the word disability. Um, cause I just think it's a learning difference. Their brain learns different. Um, and if you research, like there's even a book about the dyslexic legends. There's so many people, Einstein. Um, I mean, there's a million people that you don't even know that are dyslexic. And I think the kids find that helpful. And, and if they don't already know other kids, introduce them to other kids that have dyslexia also, it helps them to feel better about themselves. Cause it really is, um, you know, we saw, I see a pattern with the kids at my son's school, we all have the same sort of road, the same story. And there's some trauma involved when 
you get to third grade or even second and all your peers are learning and you're not. So I think reassuring them that they're just fine, they're doing just fine is, um, is also really important too. I, I would also say, trust your mom gut. All, we all have that mom gut, right? And so trust it. If you suspect there's something, trust that gut. Talk to the teacher. Actually go in, you know, since post-COVID, come back to the classroom. Go sit in the classroom and see what's going on. When you start to hear your child read versus the way that others sound as they read, that'll kind of help you to gauge what you're hearing too. So that's another great strategy is, is make an appointment to go um, visit the classroom. Mm -hmm. Good idea. That's yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, there was a question that kind of got pushed up, but it was kind of about college. And um, Dr. Futterman, this probably since you're at the college level teaching, what are students, uh, what should they be looking for if they're ready to apply to college so that they can continue to kind of get the support for their, their challenges their, uh, What should they be looking for? Yeah, so um, a, a couple of things. Once they, one is that they have to have um, a current uh, documentation that shows that they have uh, either a specific learning disability or they've been diagnosed with dyslexia or dysgraphia or whatever their issues may be. Um, so that that documentation is very important because that also they can submit that documentation if they should choose to try to apply to a college that requires the SAT or ACTs. I know those are, um, some places are now bringing those back. Others don't require them at all, which is, can be a good thing. The other thing is there, um, uh, there are a number of colleges that have specific learning centers or accessibility centers that are known to support um, students with dyslexia better than other colleges, even though most, if not all, colleges have an accessibility services center, but there are a few or, or maybe about 20 plus uh, universities that are known uh, for serving students with dyslexia. They'll provide um, so a tutor for writing. They'll provide you with extra space for testing. Um, they will, with, with notes, uh, there's a whole list of accommodations and modifications and services um, that and um, helping with course selection and planning because some students might end up taking five or six years to complete undergrad or whatever the case might be. So spending time uh, looking for those campuses that are known uh, to support students with dyslexia specifically, if that is where you're at in your search. I also want to do shout out and mention uh, Landmark College back in uh, Putney, Vermont is like the premier college for students with learning disabilities. Um, they do have, uh, I think, a program, a summer program out here in the Bay Area for high schoolers. I think there's also a virtual online program uh, for high schoolers. And then, of course, um, it could actually go there and either earn like an AA or do in between high school and college. So um, they just there are options out there um, for sure. Thank you. Uh, Becky, do you want to read one of your questions? I think we're caught um, up with that. Well, I see Angelina's got her hand oh, up. Yes, Angelina, you want to unmute? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I was the one that asking about college program. And uh, because my niece, she's going to college and she's been in a, a private school and she had a, a dyslexia and um my question is i understand that some of the colleges in california i heard i'm not sure 100 percent but they cannot take uh, same classes more than like a uh, number of times the school actually um ask them to leave to the, leave the school uh so is there any like uh, specific policy or some regulation to protect those kids Sorry, could you could you say that last part again? I, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. So, um, if any like uh, law or uh, any policy in education that can protect uh, this uh, kids, especially has uh, dyslexia, uh, learning disability uh, from. Uh, um, you know, kicked out from school basically because I know I heard some of the class in college. Um, if they same class so many times, then they you know eventually school 
uh, you know, uh, they just let them go because that happened to one of my um, friend's husband and uh, friend's wife. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if there's any protection for those kids. I would say uh, for sure, once before they arrive on campus, whatever uh, college they select, they need to register and sign up through accessibility services, disability services, whatever the name is of the center at the campus they're going to, so that they um, you will literally they will get issued a letter that they can because they're adults they can either choose to disclose or not disclose to all of their professors what they need in order to be successful, and I would make sure that. Um, your daughter or whoever is going to college that they spend a, a lot of time right now knowing how to self-advocate and uh, knowing what they need to be successful. So does that person for sure need to get their notes taken? Do they need to be able to record lectures? Whatever the case might be that they know that works for them that they need and get very clear on that um, so that because they're going to have to advocate and they're going to have to then for each class, they're going to have to contact their professor and let them know and say, hey, I have this letter from accessibility services. Um, what do the, the more proactive they can be with their professors uh, and the better I can tell you that is teaching on the other side. So the more that they're in communication, they let them know ahead of time. Um, they are, are very clear on what can work and what can't work and asking if that's okay and what can be done, um, then you're, you're setting yourself up for success. And then also to think about um, a reduced schedule, like especially maybe in the beginning, um, if they're not sure how, if they can handle a full load, four courses, you know, in a semester uh, to think about what it might look like to plan ahead of time to take a, a reduced uh, course load. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Becky's going to ask kind of like our final two questions. And as um, you know, we know people have other things to do this evening, including our panelists. So go ahead, Becky. Yes, we, we really have appreciated this. Um, so just quick two questions is, um, and we're asking all of the panelists. One, where does equity and accessibility come in in this discussion of literacy gaps? And and, and the, the second question is, what do you all think the, the best thing the library can do? So as us on the library side to support struggling readers and their families. So if each one of you will just kind of tell us about um, where you think equity and accessibility come in during this literacy discussion. And then what do you think the library can do to help in all of this too? to be a partner and just go one at a time. <laughs> or I'll say, Sue, why don't you go first? <laughs> and then Shelly and then Kathy, and then we'll wrap it up. Oh gosh. Um, I guess I would just say for, for the library to provide some materials, um, I guess, or, you know, maybe even put something out that says, dyslexic or for the struggling reader with maybe someone that knows because I would go to the library with my son and with friends and he would just be like climbing all over everything and not he did not want to be there and this is a child who I read to every day I just was so clueless I think maybe it's being talked about a little bit more but um uh, I just think maybe some resources or just something that if a parent sees that they might go, oh, okay. Cause I was really thinking like, what is wrong here? Like what, why is my child not interested in this? So I don't know if that's. That, that is helpful. Thank you so much, Sue. I appreciate that. Just okay. something that's easy for parents to see and, and help them as they're navigating, just giving them tools and yeah. information. And I think we need like to be more clear. It sounds like California has a lot of resources. So I think that is amazing. What all those resources that Dr. Fetterman listed, I'm my mouth's on the floor. I'm in Florida and we, I mean, I know we're the joke, but it, it really is. Um, we don't have all those resources. So you're lucky out there. Well, I'll tell you what Florida has. The Florida has um, the Florida Center for Reading Research, and that is a fantastic free website for any teacher, any educator. It, there are lessons based on grade that are all evidence-based and free. So, okay. well, I wonder how to do. I will. 
strategies on that website. Yeah. What was that? Say that again. Lots of strategies and activities on that website. It's the Center for Reading. Florida Center, FCRR. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Lori DePole just put the link in the chat from, she is the co-director of Decoding Dyslexia California. And uh, thank you, Lori, for being in the chat. And I also want to mention that um, on the Decoding Dyslexia California's website, there is um, a two-page, I believe it's a two-page summary of just bullet points of the California Dyslexia Guidelines. That's something easy that the library could have where people could take a flyer type of a thing. Also IDA, the International Dyslexia Association has a two, three pager uh, fact sheet on dyslexia basics. And that's something else that the library could just have. I, mean, I don't know if you guys can Xerox things, but if you just want something easy that people can take away, um, those would be easy takeaways. And then uh, we hadn't talked about yet the equity uh, and accessibility, but um, th that, impacts every layer of literacy um, and we didn't go over the numbers and um, who's you know um, basically suffering the most from uh, uh, not reading uh, uh, at proficient levels but we know that it is primarily our African-American students, our Latino students and Latinx students, our um, students who are experiencing uh, lower SES and poverty, and as well as uh, students with disabilities and our English language learners. So all, when you disaggregate data and you're looking at reading proficiency levels in the state of California, across the country, but especially in California, um, we are not serving them well enough at all. And um, we need to um, seriously uh, increase the proficiency rate across the board for all of those students. So, so equity and access uh, is a must and that's why um, all this legislation is coming about now because it, it must be a statewide initiative and I will say that California Department of Education, the State Board of Education, um, many people are taking this as a big priority, um, Gover Governor Newsom, so it's just taking okay. a little bit longer to get it all done but things are happening. Uh, we are a big state with over 1100 districts and a lot of educators, so yeah. But we, it is happening. It's just maybe not as fast as everybody would like it to. I, I couldn't agree more with Kathy. Um, you know, literacy is the greatest equalizer, right? When we think about our children um, post high school and whatever they're going to want to do when they grow up, they're going to need to be able to read. Right. And so whether that means they're going into an electrical apprenticeship, right, post college, whether they're going into college, right, um, whatever path, we need to ensure that they have that access to do whatever it is they want to do. And um, I think also supporting your school board and your superintendent, we have a school board and a superintendent who have put money for the last seven years so that each of our school sites has an early literacy coach who's doing the assessing, who's meeting with teachers, who's looking at data, right? We're a little bit, or a lot behind the game. There are a number of other states, Mississippi, for example, who've been doing this work for seven, eight, 10 years now, right? And so it's really time to support that. And so it's asking the question of your school board, how are we supporting literacy across our district? Because it does affect um, disproportionately our African-American scholars, our English language learners. And we know that through structured literacy and teachers being retrained or mm -hmm. receiving training that they can implement these things in their classroom. We have really great data in Pittsburgh about how our African-American scholars are doing outstandingly well, right, in their learning to read journey. And so we know that if we are able to work with and put money into education, these are the outcomes all of our students deserve. Um, so that get me, give me another half hour on that one. Um, but but it's really really important. It's the equity um, in action that's really really important. What are we doing? Um, and as far as the library goes, I'm super lucky, right? Because I get to work with Contra Costa County um, Library. And so we had a, we've had a number of early literacy um, activities for families 
Um, and our library has been there as a partner, which has been awesome. They actually gave um, books to our students. I think we had well over 200 at our event last Saturday, signing up for library cards. We brought out games um, that parents could take with them to play at home. Um, but partnering with them, having decodable readers. So mm -hmm. many of us, we've got these great um, stories at home that are really fun to read with your child. But if we really want to start turning to them doing the reading, they need decodable readers. And so partnering with your library, Becky's reached out to me and she's like, we need decodable readers in our in our library. She's purchased those. They've purchased that for the library. So having a decodable text that a child can practice with um, is really, really critical. So um, I'm very, very fortunate that um, I work in Contra Costa County and we've got a library who supports the work of learning to read. Can I share some of the feedback for the library? Can yes. you hear me? Yes, we yes, can hear we you. Can. Uh, hi, I'm Jia, and uh, uh, my second one is working on the learning ability for the English. And uh, my second, uh, my first one already have uh, reached the English proficiency. Uh, it's uh, great that uh, I can get the uh, same book, uh, same paper at the library. And uh, like when I get this and uh, put on the table and in front of uh, my two children, and uh, both of them are happy and. Uh, and working on them together, even though they have a different level because they're different age, but they feel happy. That's what I want to say thank you for the Contra Costa Library. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> we, we always like nice compliments. I appreciate that. Um, uh, can somebody just quickly say what, what, it, what you're saying when you're saying decodable text, and then we will wrap it up because that is a really good question. And we have been using that term. Sure, absolutely. So, decodable text would be um, words that as we learn, we start with our short vowels, the A, E, I, O, U, right? A says A. Ah. So words like cat, bat, um, even words that don't make sense like dat, but small words that students can sound out, those are decodable readers. So they're going to be small, they're going to have pictures in them, but they're going to be primarily um, words that we can read. Oh, look at Kathy's got a couple of examples right there. Um, some of our, our picture books or our story books we're going to read um, have much bigger words. If you remember, I'm going to date myself a little bit here, but that's okay. The little golden books that we grew up on and they were about the princesses, the Cinderella, and I couldn't read any of those at kindergarten, first or second grade. Those are really geared toward a third grade reading level. So we're looking for easy to sound out, three letter words at first, stretching on to that long E sound where we switch from lat, L-A-T, to late, L-A-T-E, right? And so those short readers that they can practice reading. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, it's good to have the, those terms. So um, we do need to wrap it up. I know we can have this discussion all night, but as I said, we have the things people want to do today. So thank you so much for joining us for this fascinating discussion. Um, we appreciate our amazing panelists that took their time out of their very busy schedules, even from Florida, to share their expertise. Um, we are planning another virtual event called Bilingual Learning in Children. That's going to be on Wednesday, May 1st at 4 p.m. Um, we, I'm sorry it's not available to sign up quite yet, but it will be very soon at ccclib.org. So thank you again for being here. Um, I think this was a just like a beginning discussion. We have so much more we could say, but um, we've really enjoyed our time together. So thank you. Thank you for hosting. Thank you. Of course.